Can you hear me? I was given the chance to say a few words about last year's topic, namely ventilation. Next slide. So, it is nice to be back in Finland. <laughs> Sorry, I meant Iceland. <coughs> Sixteen years ago, I went to a conference on theoretical physics in Iceland. We spent one day in Reykjavik and one week in a place called the Garden. We also went on a bus trip to see Gunfus, Jason, Think Miller, etc. I remember one night we went to a bar in Reykjavik. One of my Icelandic friends told me that you can do whatever you want in an Icelandic bar. But just don't say that you come from Greenpeace, because then they will probably beat you up. <laughs> I was diagnosed with ALS six years ago at the age of 35. So I'm now 39 years old. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to say that my ALS has developed quite a lot. Today, my whole body is essentially paralyzed, although I can still move my head slightly. Moreover, I can neither eat nor drink, and I have not been able to speak for at least three years. Fortunately, I can still breathe, but I breathe through a hole in the throat a so-called tracheostomy. Normally, I have a ventilator attached to the tracheostomy. But here in Iceland, the air is so clean that I don't really need it. <laughs> no, of course not. The truth is that I got the ventilator so early that I, until further, only need to use it during the night. Every evening when I go to bed, it is just a wonderful feeling to get attached to the ventilator. Then I can breathe normally the whole night without any effort. By the way, it is somewhat strange to breathe through a tracheostomy. For instance, it is quite funny to sneeze. <laughs> in fact, many young people in Denmark get a tracheostomy only to experience how it is to sneeze. <laughs> I'm not kidding, it is really true. It is a new trend in the discotheques. In addition, you avoid bad breath when you breathe through a tracheostomy. And this is also very important for the teenagers. <laughs> Next slide.
As I said, I was diagnosed six years ago. Less than one year after diagnosis, I got a gastrostomy to meet you. And five years after diagnosis, I got the tracheostomy. <coughs> this seems to be more or less the typical development of my type of care yet. Without the gastrostomy view, I would have died approximately four years ago. And without the tracheostomy, I would have died in January. Anyway, I'm still very much alive, and I hope that one night we will all go to an Icelandic bar. Because then I can give the following advice to my new Icelandic friends. If you can say gastros to me and tracheos to me, then you are not really drunk. <laughs> Despite my serious handicap, I feel that I am very active. I can do a lot of things. For instance, I can go to Iceland and meet a lot of interesting people. Well, relatively interesting people. <laughs> In fact, all my friends having a ventilator are very active, one way or the other. The most active is of course Edward Crow, who is the big chief of the Danish Foundation of Muscular Dystrophy. And who is traveling all over the world On the other hand, Emil Perot has a less prestigious handicap, more illness than ALS. So you should not really trust him. <laughs> to live an active life in our situation, it is, of course, necessary to have a personal assistant system. Where you can hire and find personal assistants after your own choice. The personal assistant system is very good for the handicapped person. But it is also a great benefit for the society in general. Let me just mention that my personal assistants are going into the healthcare system later on. And they get invaluable experience from taking care of me. I have nine personal assistants for the moment. <coughs> By coincidence, most of them are young women in the beginning of the twenties. <laughs> I should say though, that I also have a personal assistant who is in the middle of the thirties. Obviously, she claims herself that she is only in the beginning of the thirties. 
point you will be known when it's long and out of their brain. <laughs> Next slide. <coughs> It is just wonderful to have an empty later. But I have to admit though, that it was very tough for me to get it. You know, there are basically two ways to get an empty later. The first is the Sissium chicken wing. You, from the hospital plan in advance when you are going to get the ventilator. You drive silent and peacefully to the hospital in your own car. During the few weeks in the hospital, you feel like you are in heaven. <coughs> The second is the honest and honorable way to get an empty later. You get a serious pneumonia at home. You are more or less unconscious when you are taken to the hospital in an ambulance. Or even better, in a helicopter. During the few months in the hospital, you feel like you are in hell. Needless to say, I of course chose the honest and honorable way. Having an ventilator is, of course, that you continue to live and to avoid to die. There are many other advantages, though, but I will not mention them here in front of such a big audience because then everybody wants an ventilator. But if you are particularly interested in ventilators, you may contact me in privacy afterwards. And then I will tell you about all the other advantages. There are of course also certain disadvantages and discomforts having a ventilator. For instance, my personal assistants have to suck fluids up from my lungs approximately 300 times a day. I can, of course, take it. And Icelandic people are supposed to be very tough, so I guess that they can also take it. Next slide. In my opinion, it is a big tragedy that many people choose death instead of getting a ventilator. The ventilator means absolutely nothing compared to life itself. It is just a household utensil like the fluid processor or the microwave oven. And 
who would rather die than have him in my humble way of God. <laughs> It is an even bigger tragedy that in most countries people don't even have the choice of getting a ventilator. Think about it. It means that other people decide that your life is not worth living. I don't know about you, but it is certainly my worst nightmare that other people decide that it is best for me to be dead. I would like to make such decisions myself, and especially because it is best for me to be alive. As I see it, there is absolutely no reason to die for an ALS. You can live in many, many years with ALS if you want to. And if you have a system similar to the Danish one. And, of course, if you are a non-smoker. So, finally, I will end this talk by saying that I do not come from Greenpeace. <laughs>